Hey everyone, welcome back to First Hand Globetrotting. It's been quite a few months since I've gone anywhere, so today I'm back with another throwback vlog. This one is from a trip I took to Ireland back in 2014. That was a while ago, so I apologize in advance for the video quality from this trip. But this was a great vacation, I absolutely love Ireland, so I think you'll have a great time following along with me. As a little bit of a teaser, I'm going to wander the streets of Dublin and feel the Irish charm of the city, head down to the southern tip of the island, hear some tall tales at a world-famous castle, see the incredible rugged coastline of Western Ireland, go on a horse-drawn carriage ride through a national park, and so much more. My flight was to Dublin, so as soon as I landed, I headed into the city so I could start exploring and fight off jet lag. Dublin has a reputation for being such a fun and energetic and lively city, so I was super excited. My hotel was just off O'Connell Street, which was a great central location. It's one of the main roads in the city, so it's busy and loud, with all the cars and buses and people that are there pretty much around the clock. It felt like the sidewalks were always a sea of people moving around the city with so many stores and restaurants and other businesses here and all of the nearby side streets. If you want to find O'Connell Street, just look for the Spire of Dublin. The best way I can describe it is a huge needle sticking out from the middle of the road. Honestly, it's not the most beautiful monument I've ever seen in a city, but it's hard to miss it. If I ever get lost, it should be pretty easy to find the spire and get back to my hotel. O'Connell has a pretty huge median in the middle of it that you can walk down, and it seemed like there were statues on almost every block. All the traffic and people and shopping and statues definitely got my attention, but the most iconic thing on O'Connell Street is the general post office. It's not so much the building itself or that it's a post office, but because it was the main site of the Easter Rebellion where the Irish rose up against the British for their independence. So it's hugely important to the country's history. I don't know if it's true or a myth, but something I've always heard about Dublin is that the two things it had the most of were pubs and churches. Well, I guess it shouldn't surprise me that someone would get the idea of mixing the two of those together. It was originally a fully functioning church, but then it was abandoned for a while before eventually being fixed up and converted to a bar. I have to say, this was a pretty cool place to get a drink. There's a big bar right in the middle, but then you have stained glass, the Ten Commandments, an organ, and all of the other things you think of a church having. If you've watched any of my other videos, you know that I always love taking a walk through the super touristy parts of any place I visit. In Dublin, that was Temple Bar. It's the pub and nightlife and party area of the city, and it's where lots of tourists go when they want to drink in Dublin. There are brightly colored Irish pubs lining the streets, so it's definitely got a fun and lively look to it. But as I said before, Dublin has no shortage of pubs and restaurants all over town. And looking at the menus, the Temple Bar prices are quite a bit more expensive than the other options in the city. On to day two, I went to bed early last night because of jet lag, but I'm ready to see more of Dublin. The River Liffey almost cuts downtown Dublin in half, and most of my first day was on the north side around O'Connell Street. So I headed across the bridge to see some more of what the south had going on. O'Connell Street seemed to be where all the action was up north, but on the south side Grafton Street was where everyone seemed to be. It's a pedestrian street, and it always seemed to have huge crowds wandering around and checking out all the stores and restaurants there. I'm not a big shopper, especially on vacation, but I love being in super busy areas like Grafton Street to watch the street performers and people watch and just soak in the energy of the city. Grafton Street gave me all of the sights and sounds and chaos of a big city, but right next to it is a place that's a lot more peaceful and relaxed, St. Stephen's Green. No matter where I am, I always like walking through urban parks. I don't know what it is, but being able to cross a busy road after walking through a jam-packed pedestrian area and ending up in a sea of trees and plants and nature is just so nice. Parks usually aren't the type of places with a lot of history attached to them, but St. Stephen's Green used to be a private, gated park exclusively for the rich residents of the neighborhood. I always just associate parks with being public, so the idea that a few hundred years ago it was this walled-off sanctuary that most people couldn't enjoy really got my attention. 
but I'm really happy it's open to all of us now because it was a great spot to spend a few minutes having a snack before getting back out onto the streets of Dublin. My next stop was to experience life behind bars at Kilmainham Jail. And this isn't some fancy modern jail. It was opened way back in the late 1700s. So before I even got inside, the old stone buildings and little barred windows and stone courtyards really fit with what I was expecting from an Irish jail that's hundreds of years old. Inside, the older parts of the jail reminded me more of a castle dungeon. It was so dark and cold and depressing in this cell block. Plus, knowing that prisoners probably weren't treated very well back then made me realize that this would have been a pretty terrible place to live. Probably the worst accommodations in all of Dublin. The big multi-level cell block area in the East Wing was completely different. There was light streaming in from the ceiling, and even though it sounds weird to say it, it actually looked kind of nice. The curved edges and high metal arches and the big central staircase made this part seem much more appealing than the older West Wing. I still wouldn't want to be here, but it's not quite as dungeonous. And it wouldn't be a jail tour without going into a cell, right? It didn't have the barred doors I was expecting, but solid, heavy black doors leading you into the tiny cells with stone walls that were way too close together. And just one tiny window up top. Up to this point I've been walking around the jail, but I skipped over the part about why it's such an important place. Remember when I was wandering down O'Connell Street and talking about the General Post Office and the Easter Rebellion? Well, the leaders of pretty much every uprising and rebellion in Ireland's fight for freedom were jailed here at Kilmainham. So the story of Irish independence can't be told without looking inside these cells. There's even a plaque honoring the leaders of the Easter Rebellion who were jailed and later executed here. It's out in the Stonebreaker's Yard where prisoners had to do manual labor and fittingly has the Irish flag flying over top of it. The jail was a few kilometers outside the city center, so while I was out there I decided to head over to another park. This one is Phoenix Park and was just a little bit bigger than St. Stephen's Green. Okay, that's a huge understatement. It's massive. I think it's over twice as big as Central Park in New York City. And, like Central Park, it's the type of place you could spend an entire day wandering through and enjoying the natural surroundings. It has treed areas, and ponds filled with swans and ducks, and big grassy fields, and all of the other things you'd expect in a park. There's a road that runs through the middle of it, and it was actually a lot busier than I expected. And check this out, as I was wandering around, I came across a huge herd of deer hanging out in the middle of the park. This was totally unexpected. I'm used to seeing an animal or two in urban parks, and maybe some big flocks of birds, but I've never seen this many animals together at once. Especially not big deer like this. These ones were just out here minding their own business, having a snack without a care in the world. As I was walking around the park, it was hard to miss Wellington Monument. It's over 200 feet tall and kind of out by itself in the middle of a field, so it really sticks out above everything else. I was actually a little surprised they had it out here in the park and not somewhere closer to the city center. It's not the biggest obelisk I've ever seen since I've been to the Washington Monument in Washington DC a few times and that's nearly three times as tall. But I really like the big wide base with the steps leading up to it, almost like it's sitting on top of a pedestal. The park's actually an ultra-exclusive place to live, too. But in order to move in, you either need to be the President of Ireland, or the US Ambassador to Ireland, or one of the animals at the Dublin Zoo. So, I don't think I'll ever meet any of those requirements. Another early night, but that just meant I was up early on day three and ready for more Dublin. As I've been walking around Dublin, Guinness beer was everywhere. It's sold in pubs and restaurants, its logo was on souvenirs, and it was even visible out the window as we were driving around the city. So I couldn't pass up on a chance to tour the brewery, could I? The founder, Arthur Guinness, seemed to have a legendary and mythical status around Dublin. He opened the Dublin Brewery in 1759 and was smart enough to sign a lease for 45 pounds a year that lasted for 9,000 years. Yeah, 9,000 years. They'll be here for a while. The Guinness Storehouse at St. James Gate Brewery is a huge brick building that takes up an entire city block. 
Guinness pretty much takes up the entire neighborhood. As you probably guessed, this is a huge tourist attraction. Do you think they're proud of that 9,000 year lease? It's on display in the floor of the building right near the entrance. The tour takes you through the entire process of making Guinness, starting with the ingredients. Then you learn about how the brewing process transforms all that good stuff into the drink we all know and love. They even have models of the ships they use to transport the beer out of Dublin. If you're a fan of Guinness or just beer in general, there's a lot to see here. But I wanted to try some. The first samples were in the tasting room where they tell you a little bit more about it and give you a small taster glass. But the real taste came when we went to the penthouse bar at the top of the brewery. Not only do you get a full Guinness to enjoy, but check out the views from up here. It's lined with floor to ceiling glass windows, so you get some fantastic views out over Dublin as it sprawls out in front of you. Even if you aren't thirsty, it's worth coming up here at the end of your tour just to have a look around. And remember how I said that the spire of Dublin might come in handy if I needed to find my hotel? I can even see it from up here. How great is that? I love how there aren't any big skyscrapers in the city centre, so it makes it so easy to pick out some of the landmarks around Dublin. I'm sad to say this was my last stop in Dublin, so it's the end of this video and time to head out of town. Dublin was so much fun. It's got such a great energy and was just such a fun place to be. But don't worry, my Ireland adventure isn't over yet. Dublin was only my first stop and I have so much more to show you. I'm going to head down to the southern part of the country, visit a mythical castle, spend some time in a national park, see some incredible Irish coastlines, visit some tiny seaside towns, and so much more. Check out the video description for a link to that video. If you have any questions about Dublin, ask me in the comments. While you're at it, like the video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to my channel. On Instagram, I'm firsthand globe trotting. On Twitter, I'm firsthand globe. Follow me on there. And don't forget, it's an incredible world out there, so pick up your passport and do some first-hand globetrotting of your own.